بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی محمد و آله الطاهرین لا ما صلی الله علی محمد و آله الطاهرین مجن فرجا I would first like to thank the fellow group for giving me this opportunity to share a few moments with you dear brothers and um, they told me to speak for 10 or 20 minutes and then if there are any questions then we can then take it from there when you look at the physical realm everything in the physical realm of existence is moving and this movement is either visible to us through our five senses or it's such as when you see plants or animals grow and move or it can be measured by our five senses like radio waves or certain forms of light which we can't see with our five senses but we can measure them through our five senses but the point being that whatever is in the physical realm of existence, be it plants, animals, radio waves, it's all moving. Everything is in the process of movement. There's nothing in the physical realm of existence which is purely static. Even when you go on a microscopic level, or even smaller and smaller, electrons for example, it's all moving. It's in a state of becoming, a state of movement. Some things we may not be able to ascertain through our five senses, like stones, but even stones evolve and move. They're in a state of becoming. It was earth once upon a time, and then it becomes gold or silver or copper, and so on and so forth. So it's all moving around us. This much we can understand. And we only have to see around us, look at our surroundings. Then the question arises, where are they moving towards? Be it a stone, plant, animal or human being. All we can tell for now is that everything is in a state of movement. Movement entails something being potentially something else. So this transition from potentiality to actuality, moment to moment, it's taking place. An apple seed is potentially an apple tree, and then it's keep on, it's moving, evolving, bit by bit, moment after moment, until it becomes its objective, which is the apple tree. Then the apple tree will come to an end, it will then decay. That decay now is a new entity. It's the beginning of something else. But movement doesn't end. That apple seed becomes an apple tree. It reaches its end goal, its objective in becoming an apple tree and giving fruit. Oh, yes, okay. Yes, just don't ask me to stop again, yes. And then, after the apple tree then decay, decays and rots, then it's now, it all decomposes and a new transformation starts. So, everything is moving and it's moving towards an objective. That objective depends on that thing. For the apple seed, it's an apple tree. For other things, it's something else. Depends on that thing, what the objective is. But this transition from potentiality to actuality, it's happening moment to moment. Everything is becoming more perfect, moment to moment. Everything is evolving, growing, moving towards its objective, moving from potentiality to actuality, everything is becoming more and more perfect until it reaches its objective and then it ends there and then something else happens. 
So look, I'm using these terms interchangeably. Then we see around us there are things that exist. We exist, they exist. And these things around us which exist, they, the degree of their perfections vary from one another. For example, a plant and an animal, there are some attributes of perfection that this plant has. The animal also has and may even have other attributes of perfection which the plant doesn't have. For example, when you compare stones with plants, plants with animals, even different stones to one another, different plants to one another, different animals to one another. Then even humans, you see even there, humans, they, they bear different attributes of perfection. But that which we know is everyone is moving towards this objective, whatever it is. Everything is becoming more and more perfect by that movement. And all we can tell us, these different things, they vary in their degrees of perfection. But there's one premise we have to open up here. And that is that Everyone is after perfection. Everyone, be it a plant, animal, or a human being, it's as if everything is predestined to be on the path towards perfection. Like that, the animal growing, the plant growing, the apple seed growing, it's predestined. And with humans too, it's predestined for us. There was no, by predestined, that means there was no choice in the matter. We had no choice. We were predestined to move, one, move. Is there anything, can, can any physical thing make a conscious decision not to move? No. So that was predestined too. And then predestined to move towards perfection. Everyone has that. That's why we wake up in the morning. Even the thief has that. Even the thief, when he wants to steal from a bank, for example, or that animal who martyred 50 people in New Zealand, he saw that as something perfect. He saw that in line with perfection. That's why he did it. Perfection may be in virtue, it may be in vice, but the point is everyone is moving along and becoming more and more perfect over time. The fact that he was of a wolf, bestial attributes, that was his perfection. I think the Prime Minister of New Zealand even attended the place where this happened. But she can spare those crocodile tears. We don't need her tears. We don't have to rely on the guardianship of non-Muslims. Be careful. They don't want our best interests at heart. You have to be careful when you're living in a country where non welaya is ruling be it in New Zealand, England, or Tanzania, you have to be careful not to acquire an affinity with the rule of the land, because you're going to be resurrected as one of them. You have to be careful. They don't want the best interest of Muslims. They killed nine million Iranians during the First World War, the British, by avoiding the common lay people all types of food, the essential foods. Even they wouldn't allow them to be given animal straw. This has been documented even in their own records. Nine million Iranians died. 
if they can do it again, they'll do it again. You have to be careful not to be one of them. Yes. And then people are asking such governments for support. Look, look at the state of belittlement Muslims are experiencing. They go to a country, Darul Kufr, and then in that country they're relying on the guardianship of non-Muslims. Look, the state of Muslims today. Anyway, that was just a diverted point. That animal also believed he was acting in the best interest, in line with perfection. But that was perfection in vice. The specific application may vary, One, but everyone believes what they're doing, it's to attain to happiness, it's to attain to perfection, and that's why they do it. The fact that you're moving towards perfection, that's predestined. There's no choice in the matter. It's like the apple seed, like the plant, like the animal. We're no different in this regard. Where humans differ, maybe to some degree, is that that perfection in virtue or vice, that's a choice we make. But becoming more perfect, that's not a choice. But being that perfection, is it in vice or virtue? That's a choice we make in this physical realm of existence. And so that's the starting point. We're all after perfection. And therefore we have to seek that which is more perfect than other things. For example, you see a beautiful car, you see some attributes of perfection in that car, and it's okay. Even before seeing the car, even academically, you have knowledge that there's some degree of perfection with X car. And then you see the car with your eyes. You have more certainty in relation to the car and its per attributes of perfection. And the reason why you like the car is because of those attributes of perfection. For example, it's beautiful. Beauty is an attribute of perfection. And then you want to incorporate those attributes of perfection that the car has. That's why you like it. And then some people may stop with the car and say there's nothing more perfect. But some people go one step forward and say this has some degree of perfection. It has two or three good attributes of perfection, but I'm after more perfection, you see? Nothing can stop you in this quest of perfection, if your mind is not biased, if your rationality is not barred in any way, it'll keep on going and finding more and more perfect things. Nothing can stop this mind in its quest for perfection. This is a kind of inculcated or rather incorporated design of humans. They're after perfection, it's not in their choice. If someone stops somewhere, it's because they've become drowned in the worldly life, or they've become non-human, i.e. where animalistic traits have predominated over one. They stop, they stop with the car, they stop with the house, they stop with the job. Someone may do medicine, engineering, architecture. In medicine, there are even more attributes of perfection, more than the car, more than the house. They're curing. Curing is an attribute of perfection. Engineers do many things and have attributes of perfection which the car doesn't have. And then one wants to become a curer, a builder, a creator. All these are attributes of perfection which one is after. And then some people may stop at a job. They stop at a job. For them it's only a question of now getting a better job and a better job. But some people may see attributes of perfection in other things which are more perfect, have more attributes of perfection than a simple job. And that's, for example, a holy book. 
or maybe even a holy prophet. They see this prophet now has attributes of perfection that the job doesn't have. Patience, generosity, forgiveness, revenge. The, the job didn't have that. The car didn't have that. The house didn't have that. The book doesn't have that. But the holy prophet does. In action. And you know, this, this holy prophet now has these attributes of perfection which I'm after perfection. My mind, my rationality is my guide. It's taken me to a holy prophet. But then even the holy prophet has limit, limitations. In time, in space, was born materially, physically, 1400 years ago, and so on and so forth. So one keeps on going. Look, one keeps on going until one finds something, perfection, which is not limited by time, space, and other things. Perfection in all spheres, absolute perfection. And we have that capacity. And if one's rationality wayfares safely and securely without being sidetracked, they come to the conclusion that pure existence is absolute perfection. Not existence in a shape or form of a plant, animal or human being, but pure existence. All our starting premises, we started with existing things which contained varying degrees of perfection. It all emanated from existence. Existence, pure existence, doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end. Prophets do. They have a beginning. But pure existence doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. If it has a beginning, what was there before that? If you say something, it proves our point that it has no beginning because you admitted there's something before pure existence. If you say no thing, that's impossible. Non-existence is impossible. By impossible, we mean it's a non-reality. It's non-existence. It has no meaning. It has no reality. You can't show, prove that there's a place where there's no thing. It's a contradiction in terms. Pure existence doesn't have an end either. If it has an end, what is there beyond that end? If you say something, it proves our point. If you say no thing, that's impossible again. Everything emanates from pure existence, everything. And since it has no beginning and no end, it's infinite. It's one. Pure existence is one. Has no beginning, has no end. Everything emanates from it. This pure existence, the theologians call Allah. It's pure existence though. So even Stephen Hawking he can't deny pure existence. When you imagine God to be this super heavenly entity on one side and then creation on the other and Allah is controlling affairs, Stephen Hawking has the right to say that there may be a Lord, it's not implausible, but it's not impossible, but we don't need that Lord. He has the right to say that because he may have come to all those mathematical equations and a formulae leading to the running of the earth and you're speaking about this entity outside the earth controlling things when he's proved them all. But can Stephen Hawking deny pure existence? That's impossible. Of course he can't. No one can. No one can deny pure existence. Look, you're talking into a microphone. You've already established this exists, otherwise you wouldn't have talked into it. It exists. 
That's why you approached it and spoke into it. Even the newborn understands the mother's chest exists and goes towards it to consume milk. Even the newborn appreciates it's substantiated before them that pure existence is and then approaches the breast of the mother. No one can deny pure existence in this way. That's not possible. Because the planet exists and things exist around us. We say pure existence is the philosophical name. The theologians call pure existence Allah. And that's what we mean. Pure existence has no beginning, has no end. That can't be denied. And even in the Quran, the mushrikeen, when they're told who has created the heavens and the earth, they say Allah. They say Allah has created it. They don't deny Allah. But them being a mushrik was in relation to certain attributes of Allah. They would say, for example, the attribute of rububiyya, lordship, that they associated with Allah the Creator. That they saw outside the jurisdiction of Allah. That's where their shirk was. And there are other forms of shirk. The point is, with pure existence, no one can deny it. And since all things emanate from pure existence, all attributes of perfection that you see in all things, all of them exist in pure existence. So it, it beholds all attributes of perfection. Then the question is, can this pure existence communicate with us this pure existence which has the maximum attributes of perfection and that we try to prove philosophically and everyone has that means to come to this conclusion no one denies pure existence can it communicate with us because Guidance is also an attribute of perfection. You can't, it's not plausible to consider that the absolute perfect being, for them to have all the attributes, and it entails creating people and inviting them towards perfection, but they don't give the people a, a protocol to attain to perfection. To be like pure existence, to incorporate those attributes of perfection, we need a protocol. And here comes the sending of the prophets. If your absolute perfection, it's essentially required that you communicate and tell people what the route to perfection entails and give a protocol, send prophets with books. And here, absolute perfection has to manifest in those books and in those prophets. The prophet has to be a manifestation of pure existence, has to incorporate those attributes of perfection. If the prophet, God forbid, was a liar or was lacking in attributes of perfection, people would reject it. That goes against the wisdom of the all-perfect being. And so here, be you Muslim or non-Muslim, if you go through the books that exist, those who claim that pure existence has manifested these books or these prophets, you go through the books, you go through the prophets, and objectively and rationally, you can see where pure existence has manifested more in which prophet, in which book. See where Tawheed has manifested, absolute perfection has manifested in which book, in which prophet. 
if someone does this rational scrutiny, and actually they come to a conclusion that a prophet other than our holy messenger is manifesting pure existence more than our holy messenger, they would go towards that person. It's, it's their rationality, you can't do anything about it. Maybe they made it, well yes, they made an error in judgment, but they're going to be forgiven for that. Now, whether they were brainwashed or they made an error, where they made the error, we don't know. But you can't stop them, that's, that's their belief. Assuming it was a rational and objective scrutiny of the attributes of perfection. They looked at certain prophets, they said it manifests more here, I'm going to follow that prophet. And that prophet wasn't ours. Actually, it was someone who had no divine inspiration from Allah at all. How are you going to blame them? Yes, maybe they were brainwashed. And maybe it was their own fault that they were brainwashed. That's another issue. But that's the route we have to take too as Muslims. It shouldn't be a given. We go where absolute perfection manifests. Even in Saqifah. We follow succession that takes us to where perfection is. Now someone may have seen perfection, God forbid, more in one rather than the other. That's a mistake. But most people, they don't go through this route. They just follow what their fathers said and their grandfathers, their ancestors. Even Shias. They don't go through the correct way. And that's why they're not a true follower of Amir al-Mu'mineen. But that's the correct route. You have to see where perfection manifests. Wherever perfection manifests, you go through that route. And that's something which is ingrained in us all. But this pure existence, this is the key to Tawheed and understanding Tawheed. If this is understood, and this is the definition of Allah, then your, your worldview is now built upon this premise. Because Tawheed is the ultimate building block which everything in Islam is traced back to. That's how important it is. Everything, be it in fiqh, in ethics, in doctrine, it's all traced back to Tawheed. And Tawheed is more than just saying God is one, not two. We suffice with that, usually in Sunday schools, by unqualified teachers. But the rituals, that, they, like a caricature, you know, that is overemphasized. But the essence of Islam we've turned a blind eye to. And whenever that happens, that person who is incorporating these rituals, Tawheed Leslie, with a minimum Tawheed, they're going to fall sooner or later. They're going to fall. It's exactly like just saying what our fathers used to say. That is the Islam that they have. This Tawheed has to be incorporated. And today, the challenges are quite a lot because without knowing Tawheed, we're sending our children to university settings and academic places and where they teach you to question everything and that's natural in that setting. And then one questions religion and they don't have the means themselves to answer it. This is a, a, an epidemic plague, to say the least, in the Muslim world, where Tawhid was never taught, only Allah is one, not two. The rituals were overflated. And then, now these dilemmas arise, and we don't have the means to answer them ourselves. You know, in fiqh, when they say water is divided into qali, little water, and voluminous water. Here, 
in one verse of the Holy Quran, wa an lawastaqamu ala tariqa la asqaynahum ma an ghadaqa. That if they stay steadfast on the path, we would have satiated them with abundant water. Then Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, abundant water means abundant knowledge. He's, he opened the esoteric inner meaning of physical water. Physical water has one meaning, no problem, but the verse of the Quran are multi-layered. The Imams have opened them up. So water is knowledge. When your knowledge of Tawheed is qalil and is little, and then a najis religious dilemma comes your way, you're going to be existentially contaminated and najis. You're going to be contaminated. And that's the problem most of the youth are facing. Without being under the auspices of true scholarship, they're going on the internet, listening to people, exposing themselves to these dilemmas, and they don't know what their answer is. And they keep on reading. This contaminates them. Sooner or later, one of two things will happen. Either they'll have the audacity and bravery to say, I don't accept Islam. At least they're being honest. They went through the wrong route. They made an error. And they will be blamed for it. But they were honest. You can't force them. Rationality. If it doesn't make sense, of course it won't make sense. When you've, you've taught them by unqualified teachers in petty Sunday schools that God is one, not two, full stop, let's go now and speak about the wudu. That's, 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 it's going to happen. But those brave people are very few. Most people, they don't disclose it. And they are just like those people, contaminated. And for these people, Islam is just a, a culture. A very poor culture. No one is saying the internet is bad. Okay? But this going through these sites, listening to YouTube lectures by non-Muslims saying whatever they want, and you not being equipped and then listening to it is going to contaminate you. It's a very simple picture. In relation to Tawhid, therefore, you have to start with this quest for absolute perfection. The conclusion is pure existence then this pure existence has to communicate through prophets and books. It's essentially requiring of it. And we can scrutinize ourselves, see how much Tawheed is in the Quran, how much is in the Injil, for example. Look how Allah is described in the Quran, how it's described in the Injil. It's limited, it's, they're different. One is more complete than the other. And everyone is going towards perfection. And it's in their own hands. Just one final point is um, since pure existence doesn't have a beginning, it always was pre eternally. There's no beginning. And the attributes of pure existence never sleep. All the attributes of Allah, they always manifest. If some of them sleep for a period, rationality has the right to question that and say, I'm after something more perfect. Look. Rationality has that right to say that because they were sleeping. They were inactive, albeit for a period of time. So since pre-eternity, creation has always been. And 
me speaking into this microphone, the causes which led to me speaking into a microphone go back even to maybe two stones hitting one another more than a billion years ago, more than a billion billion years ago. It's all connected. All these cause and effects since pre-eternity, it's all connected with one another. Because existence is connecting everything together. If someone has knowledge of all those pre-eternal cause and effects, they will know what's going to happen in the future. Because they had knowledge of all those pre-eternal cause and effects. So that they know what's going to happen. It's predetermined. We believe in predetermination. That's not the same as predestination. In predestination, there's, our will is taken away. Even the Sunnis don't believe that. It's where you don't have a will, you don't have a free will in relation to your given action. But predetermination is a result of eternal number of cause and effects. One of those cause and effects is your free will. But if someone had knowledge of all those pre-eternal cause and effects, they know what's going to happen, moment to moment. Just as an analogy, you have a teacher who has a student. The teacher knows this student is going to pass or fail. And will says, you're going to fail. Because it's, the, the child has been the teacher's student for the last five years. And the teacher says, you're going to fail. And actually, the, the student passed. Why? Because the student had a private tutor, for example. That teacher wasn't aware of all the causes surrounding that student. If the teacher was aware of all the causes, he would have said, this is going to happen. Now, pure existence didn't have a beginning. There's no beginning since pre-eternity to post-eternity. All these cause and effects that have no beginning, all these manifestations of pure existence, all these manifestations of Allah that has no beginning, but all cause and effect, Allah's manifesting Himself since pre-eternity. It's all taking place. It's all cause and effect. Part of that cause and effect is your free will too. Everyone will be judged differently depending on their parents, their grandparents, many things. For example, with the Khojas, they were Hindus. Then, some, a group of people made them, for example, the uh, Ismaili, for example. It was a very important step. Now, the incentive, the reasoning behind it, they wanted to flee from oppression, whatever it was. But they went towards perfection. They will be awarded a lot. And then after that, they went to the 12 Shiza, the 12 denomination. Oh, they're going towards perfection here. They're going to be awarded a lot. Whatever you do, those initial disciples of truth are going to be rewarded until the very end, as long as the 200,000 Khojas are on earth, with all the good deeds that they do, they're going to reap, reap the rewards of that. But today, someone living, they're going to be judged a bit different now. Responsibilities differ. Judgment is a very difficult thing. We can't really judge because we are not aware of all the surrounding events and cause and effects. But the point is, it all, since pre-eternity, it's all happening. And what's happening now to us is just a, a consequence of a pre-eternal vast array of infinite cause and effects. And it's leading to our perfection, everyone to their own. It may be perfection in vice, it may be perfection in virtue. But moment to moment we have a choice. 
right now I can speak into this, I may decide not to speak into it. That the free will is always there in that perfection in vice or perfection in virtue. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala tahiri. Yes. Allahumma sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajan faraja. Okay, so I think with that long introduction, if there are any questions we can then take. Yes, so, sure, yes. You told in initial this thing speech that people generally fall into the trap of uh, uh, guardianship of wrong uh, this thing. Yes. So what are the reasons for falling people into this kind of guardianship, wrong guardianship and yes. creating uh, parallel uh, like of Islam in front of Islam? Yes, usually it's for the dunya. That's why people migrate to these places. They want a better worldly life. They want more money. It may be to escape oppression too. But that, whilst it justifies the initial step to going to a non-Muslim country, assuming the Muslim, the initial Muslim country was oppressing them, it can't justify their stay there. They have to keep on moving. But everyone, either they're fleeing to get a better dunya or to save their own lives. That is the step, initial step. Even, I don't have a problem with people going to get a better dunya or a better economic life. But the thing is, at what cost? When they go, they stop somewhere with a big house and a big car. That's the problem. In that lifestyle they've chosen to enter, they won't go after those attributes of perfection. Or they go after it to X degree, not to that degree which they have a potential to acquire. Sometimes you may see there's no other option, maybe, and someone can't move anywhere under a Wilaya system. Sometimes there may be no will or your system on earth, it's possible. Then one would have to do the next best thing and live somewhere where they are free. And they are free to do what? To incorporate those attributes of perfection. This path to incorporate attributes of perfection, the more you're free to do it, that place would be a good place compared to other places. The ideal would be an Islamic system, led by a just, you know, much dead. If that doesn't happen, you go to the next best thing, the next best thing. But America, England, these places, to go there and stay there, today it's, it's not for everyone, yes. is when they were children you had to give them a proper Islamic education and since Tawheed was almost minimal in university most probably they've all you know have, they've lost their belief because they had no Tawheed it was just a name a label but a child who is nurtured true Tawheed they would be after values they wouldn't suffice with the dunya. They wouldn't let the dunya preoccupy or rule them. So it's all the parents. How did they nurture this child? Yes. 
There's nothing more important than this form of education. Yes. You have opportunities. That's, that's right. I agree with you to some extent. Because you're after perfection and you find those opportunities and you fulfill those perfections. Like a good house, a good car, good education, good job, all these things. But then, the questions of virtue and ethical traits, the noble ethical traits, the attributes of Allah, generosity, dignity, Allah's uh, forgiveness, Allah's uh, being all haq, the just. Now, these have to be incorporated because these are also attributes of perfection. Rationality doesn't stop. You want, you keep on out. But those who go to such Western countries, they stop. Where do they stop? They stop with the good job, the good house, better job, bigger house. They stop. Why? Because of the dunya. The, sh the question is, no one has a problem with people going to America. But why do they stop when they see the foreign policy in America killing their own people, killing Muslims in foreign lands? Why don't they stand up? They've been desensitized by the dunya. Otherwise, if you go there and keep on going, yes, that will be good. Speak about it. Yes. Now, you have to speak about it. Go against it. Yes? Now, go going into the political system, that's something else. That depends on the country. Because in some countries, going into the political system on a high level, um, even becoming a president makes no difference. Other people are ruling everything. Th that, you can't enter such a system. Only in those countries where the president is truly independent and has a say, a, you can vote or become part of such a system. Um, so, the point is, most people who go, most, I'm not saying everyone, what we're seeing is they stop in that journey of perfection and they're not ready to incorporate the noble ethical traits of Islam at the cost of financial and economic prosperity. And since that's a reality, we have to be careful. It doesn't matter, America, even in Tanzania. It doesn't matter where. But one has to keep on growing. It may even happen in an Islamic state. That's even possible. It's, the, it's one of the objectives of any Islamic state that the route towards spiritual salvation has to be open for anyone who wants to acquire it. Now, how can someone living in England do that when they know they're paying their taxes to a government who's spilling the blood of the Yemenis, for example. How can you be part of that? How can you stay there and do nothing and just say, I'm after my economic prosperity? That's not, you've stopped. You haven't gone forward. Those noble ethical traits of being just, doing revenge, executing revenge, these are attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've stopped somewhere. Why did you stop? Because you want your own big house, your big car. Otherwise you should have been ready to know, 
I want to incorporate these attributes. It's not in your control. Yes. Yes. Now, the, yes, the two points you mentioned, giving taxes is not in your control, yes, but you're giving it. At least try to compensate. That amount of money you give in taxes, give to the Yemenis, to the Palestinians, to Kashmiris, whatever. That's one way. Staying in a cocoon, as you put it, well, what's wrong with that? If all the Muslims of Great Britain, of France, of Germany were to leave and go in this cocoon of yours, the economy there will cripple. Why should we belittle ourselves? Let's build that cocoon for ourselves. Let's become stronger. We're feeding these oppressive economies. We're feeding them. With this migration, we're feeding them. Yes, yes. I feel that's a very good point. Although I'm not supporting Iran here as the ideal Islamic State, but something like that, Iran, for example, should afford. It's a most of the land in Iran is not used. The the the, the province of Khorasan is bigger than England, one province, and most of it is unused. Why shouldn't they invite people? to come to Iran and give them Iranian citizenship and give them all the rights as any other Iranian, those who want to come, of course Iran will be stronger. Of course Iran will be stronger. And then give those rights, let's say a plot of land, to let's say 100,000, 200, 4 million, 2 million, whatever. That's in the best interest of not only Iran, because they'll, they'll be all Iranians. Even if a Hoja goes, they'll get Iranian citizenship. It's in the best interest of Islam. But Iran is failing in this regard because it has its own, they're drowned in all these tests, sanctions, they're doing it alone, very little help from other countries. It's going to take a long time before they come to such a... It's natural. You just have to now make the right choice. It's, it's a choice between bad and worse now. But make the bad one rather than the worse. Pardon? For example, you go somewhere where that quest in the line of perfection and incorporating the attributes of Allah, it's more easier for you to do. You can incorporate more than in another place. And that, you have to make that decision. For everyone it's different, yes. These are just, I'm just giving you some theoretical principles. When I mention a country's name, I may be wrong in mentioning the name of a country. Don't, don't fault me with the, the, the specific application, the mistar. I'm just giving you the general formula how to make a plan for your life. Speaking of what we've done for life, same thing. We have been exposed to so much knowledge or that's literacy of business life, financial uh, management, from non Islamic. Uh, lectures and uh, speakers, because that is what is apparent. Yes. We have not heard more about financial management or business modeling from Islamic. Islamic, people. yes. So it's natural for us to move to this kind of... Yes. We, we are not exposed to yes. the fake religion of Java the Islam is very... Yes. Yes. That, that's the fault of the ulama. Yes. They have to teach. Yes. Yes. They have to blame as well. Yes. Right on this kind of, we don't know if Islam has said something about how do you measure finances? Yes. What kind of budget do you need to live in? Yes. I'm not aware of anything. No. Where do we get this kind of... Uh, well, the person sitting next to you, they've translated Shahid Saad's um, <laughs> critique against... Yeah. In, 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 in Swahili, so yes. you can... It's, look. That's fine, but yes. I just want to see my point. Right? Yes, I understand. Right. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, yes. Yes. So. Yeah. 
Yes, Islam in Western countries has to be propagated by those who are living there? Yes. Um, I remember once we went to Iraq um, and one of the Maraj's representatives there said that Muslims living in England or America, they, they have to be ambassadors for Islam. That's a very heavy statement. How can you be an ambassador for Islam? me or you, when our Tawheed is so compromised. It's almost on the brink of a joke. It's a very sad joke. How can we be an ambassador? But he said that. So that means that, that is an ideal. So let's say when you go to such countries and you compromise your faith, well, go back. Go out of there. Because in the Quran, one of the questions that the angels ask, in the traditions, the angels say, Man Rabbuk, who is your Lord? Or, Man Nabi Yuk, Ma Kitabuk, who's your prophet? Who, what's your book? These are in the traditions. In the Quran, the questions of the angels are explicitly mentioned. This question that they say, Why are you in hell? And you say, We were suppressed. Suppressed meaning we didn't have that access to perfection. Mustad'afin, or those who were suppressed in reaching that goal of perfection in incorporating Allah's attributes. Then the angels will say, well, Allah's earth was spacious. So, okay, the potential for you to be an ambassador for Islam, although it's very difficult, is there. If you're failing though, then go somewhere else and you fail, go somewhere else. In America, there's a Christian denomination where they're living in isolation. They don't even pay taxes. Look. I've forgotten the, na the denomination's name. Yes, yes. The Hamish, yes. Yes, Hamish, yes. Yes, right. Now, that's an exception under, somehow under US law. But I'm saying, um, we can do that. Rather than feeding an oppressive economy, we can go and build, build our own. In the same way that your forefathers made a very difficult decision to do what they did, you can make a very diffi diffi difficult decision. And you may not reap the benefits of your decision, but generations after you may benefit. Yes. But then, uh, sure, is it not possible that from our side there is a mistake that we have not presented Islam as a system? system yes. You yeah. know, because we, this is happens what a curious businessman, he is about to head into the economic world sooner or later in a couple of years. Myself, I have seen the world. I have. I am going into retire, retirement life. <coughs> So he is looking that as far as business goes on, I am going in unethical way, non-Islamic way. I have been taught and I have been brought up. Mm. He, he has his own problem. Yes. Somebody came as a, let's say, like a professional or carpenter or something. He understands Islam is in his own way, that I have been taught in unethical way. Yes. Commerce, I have been taught in unethical way. But overall the problem doesn't, it is, it is not like that, that we lack to understand Islam as a system as a system which has to be imposed on day-to-day -day life, yes, human yes, life. And yes. overall, the, overall the whole system has been led by Vilaya, yes. Waliya Faki, yes. where he can, as a leader, he can guide us towards where is the path of success, where is the path of truth. So probably if we introduce or we understand Islam as a system, there are many problems we can Sort it out. Avoid, yes, yes. So, how do we start? We start by following and be under the supervision of true scholars, under the walaya of yeah. the leader. That's how we start. And uh, one more question I want to ask, since we run a small group, Fala uh, Institute, where we are trying this thing, that we should introduce Islam as a system a of system. our life yes. you know, in this world. So now, 
we have a certain good points like uh, we should understand the actual values, important values, how it interconnect with each other. Mm. The way you said that uh, there is a potential in a human being, it means small sperm coming into the ovary, it has got its own set of laws which works in harmony to yes. give a new life <coughs> which has got a potential and when it reached to ultimate stage, it has become like a kinetic energy. Right. right. Yeah, yes. So, don't you think that we have to work out like a values of our Islam, values on Quran, which has been stated in each and every aspect yes, of Islam. Yes, yes, yes. And, and how the way, right way? Yeah, it, it's definitely the right way. But since we are qadil in knowledge, mm. we can easily be contaminated. Mm. Right. So we have to be connected with the core. Core, yeah. Yes, true knowledge, yes, true knowledge, yes. True that is the beginning. But you have to find scholars in general, and then in, you have to investigate. You have to ask. For example, let's say you want to find a doctor, okay, a good doctor. Sometimes you have a common cold. It doesn't matter which doctor you go to. You may even avoid going to a doctor and just go to the pharmacy. You know what the doctor will give you. But sometimes you have, God forbid, cancer or a form of diabetes. It's important now, the doctor. So here, who do you go to? Because you don't have knowledge of diabetes. And you go just on the internet, and they say any kind of rubbish on diabetes and say things on cancer. You don't know whether this is a correct source, not a correct source, you don't know. So you go to doctors. You can start with general practi practitioners. The general practitioners know of famous oncologists oncology centers, diabetes specialist centers. Then you go to them and you say, let's say in Tanzania, where is the best oncology cancer center? They may say, we don't have one. The nearest is in, let's say, Kenya. Or they say, no, we have one. It's in Dodono. Or what's the name of the capital here? Dodono. 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 Yes. You have to go there, for example. Then you see that from the doctors you ask, the same two or three names keep on crop, cropping up. You know that these two or three, they're better than the rest. The same with scholars. Now those two or three in the scholars, now in each science, you, the protocol for fiqh is one thing. In akhlaq, something else. In each science has its own protocol. But in fiqh, for example, when you find a, mar a marriage, for example, you go through this process too. Let's say if you don't understand the language of the marriage, you go through his books or through his students or those who know that marriage's teachings. If you don't know, have access to the strongest person in ethics, in Irfan, in philosophy, you go through their books or their students who know Okay, so, but the connection is always made there. But the sad thing is, what's happening, especially in the West, their access to true knowledge is only the person who comes in the pulpit. And the person who comes in the pulpit doesn't reference themselves. You have to ask, you have the right, that whoever says anything on the pulpit, you have to trace it back to the main scholars. Yes. Okay. I think we'll stop there. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.